Wine TV. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm. Welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm your host, Mark Fusco, here for a special edition show. I'm here with JC Defender. <laughs> Defender uh, for Defender for after we, we went over this for a few minutes beforehand. Um, so he's the director of winemaking for the Hope Family Wines. So you may you may recognize the name Austin Hope, and that's the wine I have here. I was part of a, a little Zoom type of call a few weeks ago, maybe two or three weeks ago. Um, with three different Paso Robles uh, wineries, uh, Austin Hope being one of them, uh, and Austin Hope was on the call, and along with uh, J. Lore and Dow, and uh, this was actually one of the wines that we did, and so I saved some in the hopes of doing some interviews, and I got an interview, so I'm really happy about that. So, JC, uh, why don't you kind of kind of tell us about you, how did you get here and, and into the winemaking business, and we'll go from there. Well, perfect. Well, thanks for having me here, Mark. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. So a little bit about uh, who we are and at Hope Family Wines. So Hope Family Wines, uh, the Hope family came to Pastor Robles in 1978, um, and they started planting grapes here. And at that time, Pastor Robles wasn't even an AVA at the time, and it was just starting. It was, there was about 24 wineries here, and... Um, was very kind of in its infancy. And so they started planning and they started with Chardonnay and uh, apples. And uh, they figured out that uh, neither was the number one thing here. And so they moved to Cabernet and uh, Cabernet has kind of been king here in Paso Robles. And so they started planting Cabernet and they actually were one of the largest growers of Cabernet in Paso in the beginning, um, in which that's kind of where uh, uh, winery up north saw us uh, that produced Liberty School and we started producing the wines for Liberty School and then it kind of grew from there. Uh, Triana started and in 1996 uh, we took over Liberty School, brought it down here, uh, came up and started the brand Triana to really showcase what Pass Robles uh, was becoming as a, as a great wine region and uh, that's when austin started taking over the operations and at that time uh, austin and myself we we've, we've been friends since we we're 11 years old so kind of really grew up together um austin is if any of you know austin austin we're the yin and yang of each other uh he is a, a just big personality uh lots of ideas um really likes to you know see things and go for it uh, i'm the person that makes things happen and we've been like that since uh, high school growing up kind of where the the name of one of our brands troublemaker comes from um it's kind of things that we've done um so with that we we started building the winery and he asked me to hey come on help him start to build the winery and uh, that was 1996 and so i helped put the winery together get it built get started um, at that time, our winemaker was Chris Phelps out of Dominus uh, that came over to help us uh, start the winery. And I worked under Chris for the first three years and uh, went back for red wine production up at Davis and, and uh, went back for studying at that point and worked under Chris and took over from there. And I took over Liberty School at that point and then grew from there and then uh, in 2001, I became director of winemaking uh, for all the brands, and uh, we grew from there. Um, where we're at now, uh, we have uh, our state winery, which is all Rhones. Um, those the the Syrah, the Grenache, the Movedra. Uh, we do a little Roussan there. So everything's there at the estate, uh, and then all the other wineries that we use, or all the other vineyards we use, um, is either contract or leased uh, within our program. Um, we have 
kind of in the last few years really pushed. We were one of the original people that jumped on with the SIP certification and pastoral sustainability in practice. And we've really pushed that to all our growers. Uh, and so we're up to about 94% uh, SIP certified right now with all our growers. And uh, our goal is to have it 100% within the next two years. Um, so we're, we're a big push on that and, and been on that board and, and uh, been working with them for that. Can you, but, um, go ahead. Uh, with, with SIP, can you kind of, if people don't know what SIP is, can you kind of explain what that entails? So there, there's a lot of uh, sustainability practices. Um, SIP is one of them, organic is one, uh, biodynamic. Uh, each one has kind of a different uh, focus, but they're all kind of similar in what their practice is uh, in, in working with the ground and nature and being sustainable. Uh, SIP is sustainable, san, sorry, sustainability in practice is what it stands for. What it means is that all of our aspects of our business are sustainable. And what we do to, to figure that out is we go through our vineyards and, and how do you farm? Um, what is your practices? Uh, how is our uh, insects and um, what do we plant for, for the cover crop and how do we process and how do we farm as well as how do we treat our employees? Uh, what is our practices um, for sustainability there? As well as is how do we um, run our farming equipment? How do we use our resources? Uh, all those are part of the sustainability um, to get certified. So you fill out everything, you work with them, how to improve the best practices to make it better. And then now we go out and work with our growers to do the same thing. Okay. So it goes from the winery, it goes from everything. Um, I mean, it goes down so deep in the winery that typical wineries uh, in the 90s were using nine gallons of water to make one gallon of wine. So that means between harvest and washing the floors and cleaning the tanks and every process, uh, they would consume nine gallons of water to make one gallon of wine. Uh, I'm down to 2.4 gallons for one gallon. Um, most wineries are about down to about six gallons to make one gallon. Okay. Um, so it's, it's a major thing when you add it all up, um, but it's just a process that you learn best practices and implement those. Uh, so that's kind of what SIP is. Organic is, is more about the farming process um, and what you're allowed to use and how you use it in the field. And biodynamic is more of a principle and how you farm. Um, biodynamic, and one of the things that I really like about biodynamic too, is the amount of time that you're in the field uh, noticing what uh, is happening. I think that is one of the major parts of bio biodynamic is that uh, anyone that's out there watching everything, you're gonna do a better job. Yeah. Uh, in, in terms of how things are done, you know, there's a, there's a lot of discussion there. Um, yeah, I think I think you know, bio has a lot of great um, aspects to it, and um, you know, I, I I like if a winery can at least do something sustainable, organic, bio. I mean, I think if you are doing the least amount of conventional farming possible, I think it's great. I know there's some parts of the world that is this kind of hard not to have some conventional farming, like places like Germany and all that. Um, but you know, the, the least conventional that you can do the better, but there are some great wines that, you know, they just have regular farming. So, um, you there know. is, uh, I think, if, and for the long term, what we're looking for is, you know, I'm fifth generation, uh, this County here. So I grew up, my, my family has been farming here since the uh, late 1800s. Um, so a lot of the things that we have done, uh, is almost reverting back to a lot before then. Uh, I think as chemicals came out to help people, I think uh, we got a reliance on those and it's been a little bit more than, you know, and then everyone's kind of going back to, hey, how do we use nature to help mitigate uh, some of the inset problems? How do we use nature to help in the farming versus, uh, 
you know, kind of the, the term that we use here is like nuclear farming, mm -hmm. um, where through the 70s and 80s that all the fields were bare from weeds because anything that showed up, they would spray, spray, spray. Um, but then you would also lose a lot of beneficial insects. Um, and those are things that we kind of learned that, oh, that process is better. Why don't we go back to that and, and blend it all together to make a better process? And I think that's where SIP came in was what is the best practice for the soil to make the soil living, to make uh, our beneficial insects and beneficial uh, population increase? What kind of cover crop and plants should we plant to incentivize that? and also help with the water retention and water usage. Uh, how can we take our cuttings and uh, winery waste and reincorporate that back into the vineyard uh, to grow that, that health of the whole vineyard? So a lot of those processes is, is what that became. Very nice, man. I, and thank you for doing that. I really appreciate that. Yeah. Um, so I, I kind of interrupted you when you were, I don't know where you're going to go to next, but I really want to, I, I feel it's kind of important to kind of highlight that. Um, so I, I, where were you going to go next after I, inter before I interrupted you? Uh, well, I just kind of going through, of, of, you know, the growers and then uh, we started building the winery and, mm -hmm. and from that um, we look at, so our brands are something that are meaningful to us. Uh, I think it, it's something that we've, come from. Um, so we have, you know, Liberty School, which is the great everyday uh, wine that really showcases what true Paso Robles is. Uh, it's a great value. Uh, we have Troublemaker and Troublemaker was a kind of a compilation of things. Um, and it's kind of funny that, you know, everybody, uh, when you say that name, it really clicks with everyone. Everyone looks at it and says, you know, you made this wine for me. You know, right. You're thinking of me when I you're thinking of troublemaker and and everyone just loves that. But then when they try the wine, they're just like, wow, this is actually really good. Um, and so what troublemaker is 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 you know it came from us and I were growing up. Uh, a lot of times, um, Austin was asked to take a little break from school, um, so that week off, uh, his dad would send him in the fields to work and uh, hoe weeds and and work in the in the field as labor. And Austin always loved doing that. So that was something that we've always, you know, we got stuck out there. You know, Austin and I, and, and we were in eighth grade, we used to be out there hanging wires and training vines and, and doing vineyard work. And that was how we made money to go snowboarding and how we, you know, had fun. So that was just something that we always did. And so Troublemaker was that perfect name. And it was also at the time as everyone was looking for single bridles, uh, the vintage was a major thing. So Troublemaker is a multi-vintage blend of multi-varietals. So it's Syrah, Grenache, Mavedra, uh, with a Zinfandel, Petit Syrah in there. And so it's wines that taste good together, wines that are symbiotic together, that work together. And so we would do blends, uh, they're multi-vintage. Uh, we would make wines how we wanna make wines and not worry about anyone else. Um, and so that's kind of how that one came about. Uh, and it really kind of took off and, and people love that wine. Um, Austin Hope was one of the newer ones that we just did. Uh, so Austin Hope was kind of the culmination of, we've been doing Cabernets here since uh, the late 70s. Um, Triana was kind of our flagship Cabernet of, of Super Paso. What is the best that Paso can do? Um, and then we kind of ramped up and we started developing a lot of these vineyards. And over the years, you know, Austin and I really grew up in the vineyard. And I think that was our major love and our start there. And then the winery kind of blossomed from, you know, what you do in the vineyard uh, to make the wines that you felt that, that you could make. Um, with that, the Cabernets in Paso, you know, we, we've been on a really fast learning curve, uh, but the, the first wines here um, were made, we had the, you know, I think we had the wrong rootstock here. We had, you know, the wrong clonal selection. And we really kind of been involving those things. And since about 2007 has been a major uh, changeover in Paso Robles. And I think in pretty much all Paso wines in the last, you know, 15 years, you've probably noticed a major change and a major evolution of quality and uh, style to them. And a lot of that has to do with, with our vineyards. 
and finding the right rootstocks and finding the right clonal selection that works in past robles. Um, and I think we've really found that. And so Austin and I have developed a lot of vineyards in the great uh, sub AVAs of past robles. And now that those have been coming online and doing well and, and, and developing really well, that's kind of where we started with Austin Hope brand to kind of be the, the best of the best and the, you know, what vineyards work the best for us. Uh, let's take those wines. And then we go down to the sub blocks. What best blocks in those vineyards do the best? And then that's where we started with Austin Hope Cabernet. Uh, we do a little bit of the Austin Hope Reserve, which is, you know, basically we select out of the Austin Hope Cabernet, what were the best barrels and a little small amount becomes the Austin Hope Reserve. Okay. Well, very nice. So since we're on the subject of Austin Hope, I mean, this wine is really delicious. I mean, it's, I, so I actually had a glass of this at lunch today. Um, had it with some pasta. Uh, my dad tried a little bit. He was like, Oh, that's good. <laughs> so, um, you know, when dad says something and that's definitely not a wine connoisseur, but you know, sometimes I hand him a wine. He's just kind of like, it's okay. And I kind of look at him and I'm like, Dad, that's like a really good wine. But the other times I'm like, try this. And I, I know this was absolutely up his alley, this type of flavor profile. And he was like, oh, that's good. I'm like, yeah, it should be, <laughs> you know. So, yeah. Um, so it has dad's seal of approval. But and, and I, and I, I think it's a totally different style than um, – not style. I think it, it, it's the next step of Pass Robles of kind of encompassing, you know, You've had wines with great fruit, wines with great texture, tannins, structure, um, and putting it all together into one wine. Uh, it's, con it's kind of been a vision of everyone, but I think that's one of the wines that really kind of clicked, uh, putting everything together. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think I think you're, you guys are doing a great job with the wine and, you know, definitely something that I think has, you know, really great uh, appeal for a lot of people. Um, I think it's delicious, you know, and yeah, I mean, I was, I was uh, really happy to have it again. I told you, um, I, did we say it on camera or off camera? I can't, but I've, I've had it one other time before, um, you know, and um, I, I really liked it the, maybe like two or three years ago, I think I had it, oh, probably at least three years ago. And, um, and then when I got it for that, for that Zoom, uh, that Zoom presentation that, that was done, you know, I was like, okay, let's try it again because I hadn't had it in a while. And, you know, I definitely enjoyed it. Yeah, it's always surprising. And that's, I think, pretty much all our wines uh, have always really been that way um, stylistically. Uh, they're barely, they're, we like to make wines that, that people like to drink. Uh, I know everyone, uh, that's a, there's so many cliches in the wine industry of, you know, uh, the wines are made in the vineyards which is a very true statement, um, but it just sounds, you know, funny when you always say it to everyone. It's just, you know, we want wines that everyone wants to drink. Well, yeah, everyone wants that. Um, but I think as you go through our wines, you can see kind of uh, across the board that there is uh, commonality throughout them, and they're at different elevations. I mean, from the Liberty School to the Austin Hope, Yes, there are different price points, and yes, there's different philosophies behind each one. But stylistically, they have a quality that uh, can be enjoyed. And it can be enjoyed, um, you know, we, we kind of take a lot of the the complexities out of the wine where it's um, a person that, that's just entering uh, wine and, and, and the comprehension of, of how wine's put together to a master psalm that, that dows into these wines and, and looks at... Uh, the tannin and anthocyanins and, and the whole structure of the wine and, and how it shows uh, to our and, and uh, the region that it's from. Um, so I think some of all these wines are, are able to to really dig deep and, and see a lot of um, depth to them, uh, but also they're they're enjoyable for the novice that's getting into wine and, and wants to enjoy it um, and not have to think about it. Yeah, exactly. And then I think yeah, you guys are doing a great job with it. This little side note, I, I was telling JC earlier that um, back in 2010, I had reviewed the 07 Liberty School and I watched the review to make sure I liked it. And I remembered liking it, but um, it was, I told him it was one of the rare uh, 90 point 
wines I ever did because I, I wouldn't, I didn't give a lot of wines above 89. And I got to the point where I was, where I used to give ratings and I gave it a 90 point. So if I gave that thing 90, this probably was a, a probably should have had more points just knowing how, how tough I was on scoring. So, um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, and you're talking value wine there and I think Paso just has great value, you know, um, yeah, I mean, for that price, compared to other that regions, yeah. Phenomenal wine. Absolutely. But I want everyone to try everything. So, yeah. You know. <laughs> yeah. you know, and then there's also we have a, a, a new brand uh, uh, Quest mm -hmm. and uh, Quest just came out a couple years ago and, and it's a blend um, and we're doing this as a blend of uh, Cap Franc and Cap, Cap Sauv uh, and we have some incredible Cap Franc I think Cap Franc is going to be a new not a, it, it's going to really grow in, in the you know, in California, Central California region and the coastal region here, uh, it does so well around here also. Uh, there, there's so many varietals that do well. I think that one's going to really take off. That'd be really nice. Yeah, I need to try some of that Quest. I'll, I'll try to get some here soon. Um, yeah, and Cab Franc is just something that I really enjoy. As a matter of fact, yesterday I went to a place, a uh, wine bar that's here in my tasting group. Um, I was doing it via Zoom, but the other guys were were at the wine bar that we do it at, and they were they had a Chinon, and they kept describing it, and I was just like, I want some of that. So yesterday I picked some up, <laughs> so I can so I can have some of that. Maybe not tonight, but some, soon <laughs> I'll have some of that. Yeah, I, Cap Franc is one of those uh, grapes that doesn't get a lot of love, and people don't really know what's what it's about, and I think it's you know. It's a cool grape to, to, to check out. Yeah, when you have a gray one, you're like, wow, it's so, yeah, no, I have a, a, the new bottle of that, so I uh, can't wait for you to try that one. Let me let me know what you think. Oh, yeah, I definitely will. Absolutely. Um, oh, and I forgot to say that I've also had the Triana Red Blend before. That was probably about two, three years ago. I was just, I was just like at a restaurant, and I was really impressed with that one, too. Um, Triana Red's been, it's always been one of my babies that I've really loved. Um, and it, it's kind of funny when, when I travel around, uh, everyone looks at you and they, they see the different brands and they're like, what is your favorite? And, uh, I always look at them and I said, what's your favorite kid? Yeah. I know you have one. You just can't say it. Um, <laughs> the wines are kind of the same. Uh, you know, they're, they're like, they're like my kids and, and, uh, each one has, you know, something special about it. Each one has its issues. Um, but again, you, I do have favorites, but the favorites change sometimes. Um, uh, my Triana Chardonnay, I love that wine. Um, it's different than, than just Chardonnay. Everyone's, you know, the ABCs and, and, uh, and I say, just try this wine. It's not your typical Chardonnay. Uh, we pull the Chardonnay out of some cooler, uh, region so uh, Los Olivos and Monterey those are some of my favorite areas for Chardonnay and we'll blend some grapes out of there and it's just it's bright it's clean it's crisp it's round uh, I actually throw a little Marsan in there and uh, and the Marsan adds a texture to the back of it that that just brings it all around and and it, it almost a nuttiness to it so it's Marsan can uh, almost look like uh, it has oak on it, but without any oak at all, it's, it's pure neutral and tank ferment, but uh, it adds that kind of character on the, on the back palate. That's, that's incredible. So people love, you know, as they try it, they, oh, wow, this is incredible. Um, so those are the kind of wines that we look at that, that we love. For the viewers that don't know what the ABC is, it means anything but Chardonnay. So <laughs> <laughs> if you do, I, I've, I've used, used that phrase plenty of times before so and, and I always I drink everything if, if it's a well-made wine I enjoy it you Same know here. from Averino's to uh, Chardonnay's um, I, I like to have well-made wines um, and I'm open to everything I try everything um, but if it's a well-made it's you know it's a good wine I love exactly. Merlot uh, Merlot is probably one of my favorite Same here. <laughs> um, and it's just you know, a great Merlot, you bring it to someone and, and they flip for it. Uh, we really pushed Merlot for years and we're trying to do a Liberty School Merlot. And the coolest thing about that was, you know, it was kind of after the movie 
And there was some phenomenal Merlot vineyards that just were not getting love because, you know, everyone stopped buying Merlot. And the Liberty School Merlot was probably, uh, the grapes were probably a, made for a $40 bottle, but we were selling it for, you know, $15. And everyone that had it was just like, oh my God, this is incredible. This is an incredible wine. And, and I kept telling people, but it was just, it never really took off. Um, and we did a Merlot for the tasting room. And so we did a real small volume. We did about uh, under a thousand cases and it disappeared in two weeks. Uh, it was just, people went nuts over it. People are still asking me for it. That was two years ago. I still get requests for that Merlot. Um, so when it works, it works, but uh, it's always been one of my favorite varietals. Um, but it's always hard. There's so many incredible wines and styles and everything out there that uh, my biggest thing is tell people just uh, don't close something down. You don't like it, don't drink it. Uh, but try these these varietals and and try these wines, and uh, you'd be amazed at, at different wines that you pick up. Um, on that story is I have a, another wine, the Triana Blanc. Uh, so Triana Red, you talked about Triana Red's a great wine. It's seventy five percent Cabernet, twenty five percent Syrah. It is when it touches your palate, it's elegance. It just, it's very robust, but it's just an elegant wine, and people love that. Uh, similar is the Triana Blanc, which is Viognier Marsan Roussan blend. Um, the hard thing about that is the white rums, uh, rarely people go into a store looking for a white rum. Um, and it's a wine that I recommend because it's almost like you have an epiphany when you try it. It's an incredible wine. It's, it's oily and viscous and lush and rich. Um, but it's also clean on the finish. Uh, it's a white wine that you can put it after you have red wines, taste red wines, taste this wine behind it. It's almost like a lemon sorbet. It cleanses your palate. Um, it's just, it's, it's fresh and rich and, and beautiful. And, um, uh, it was always a wine that I loved. And every time I have someone and they try it at a tasting, uh, they look like, wow, I never even imagined that I would try this wine. And, now that I do, I love it. So it's it's always a crowd pleaser. And if you ever have like a wine tasting or you go to a, a friend's house and you bring that, um, it always surprises them because no one no one knows anything about it. Uh, but when they try it, they're just wow. So. Oh yeah. Do you think that's like a good substitute for a Chardonnay? If it is, it, it is. It's a it's a bigger white wine. Um, and when I say bigger. I mean, more of it, you know, the viscosity to it, the texture uh, it has an oiliness to it, um, a richness. So it's a great, you know, wine if, if people want to try something else other than Chardonnay, but also have something that has weight and structure to it. Um, a lot of people have it, a lot of red wine drinkers uh, love it. So we always say it's a white wine for the red wine drinker, uh, just because it has that texture, that weight and the structure to it. So. Yeah. Nice. It's, uh, it's not a it's not a light and fruity wine. It's it's more of a you know it has some viscosity to it and and some really big depth to it. Some uh, some wineries here in Texas are having some good success with all three of those grapes um, as single variety wines. Um, you don't really see a lot of Marsan or Roussan on its own, but a couple of wineries are doing that, and it's pretty incredible to taste them on their own. I mean, granted, it's Texas terroir, not Rhone. But it's just incredible to, to kind of see what these what these grapes can do on their own. And then when you combine the three or two of the three, it's it's really great. Yeah, I mean, they really complement each other. Um, they are wines that can grow in cooler climate as well as warmer climate. Um, and they do really well in both. Uh, they have two totally different styles in those, as you can imagine. Um, but uh, the Viognier we do is out of uh, Mersolet Vineyards up in the San Lucia Highlands. Um, so the neat thing about that is, is we can pick it very bright. So we're picking it at you know, 26, 27 bricks uh, with TAs of, uh, of one still or 10 on, on the grams. Okay. Um, wow. So extremely high uh, acidities to them, but rich and lush. And so it's, you know, high sugars high TAs, it's retained its acidity, it's very ripe, um, but it's just an incredible wine. And 
a lot of people, I'll pull them out of the barrels and, and pull samples, and they're just like, wow, this is so good by itself. And then you take the Marsan, and I'll leave a little bit of the, the Viognier in the glass, and then I'll pull some of the Marsan and put on top of that. And then they're like, oh, wow, this is just, they're two, you know, when you put those two together, it's just um, amazing what they do to each other. Mm -hmm. That's cool. So, <laughs> you know, it's a That's fun thing awesome. to do in the cellar, and it's, you know, you make it you make it look like it's like a magic trick and uh people love it and it's always nice when you already know it's gonna what's gonna happen you know right but oh, they, yeah. they feel like we almost discovered something um but i love going there and doing that and, and people it just those little things in life kind of is if you listen to a lot of stories from different winemakers these are things that uh changed their course in life they were like, hey, I was going to go be a computer programmer, um, and I was at a winery, and we did this, and and I decided this is what I want to do. Um, a lot of people just kind of did that. Uh, I think, you know, Austin and I are, are really blessed that we grew up doing this. And it's kind of funny that growing up, this wasn't our plan. Um, I wanted to be, among other things, I wanted to be a circuit board engineer growing up, uh, <laughs> which which they don't even make circuit boards anymore. Right. Um, but that was something, you know, I was, you know, growing up, we worked in the vineyards, we worked in farming. That was something that we had to do. Uh, it wasn't something that we saw as, you know, this is our career path or this is what we're going to do or, you know, we have to do. Um, it was just something that we did growing up. And then as we kind of evolved, we looked back and said, you know, that was something that, we, you know, we were blessed to be able to go do that. It was, you know, how lucky were we to grow up in the vineyards and do this stuff um, and enjoy it and see it. And now we're just happy to be here and, and do this and, and uh, be able to live this life. Uh, I mean, many people, you know, change their careers and change their life to, to go do this. And this is what we grew up doing. So do you, do you think that maybe there's, is, is there a shift where families are getting that second and third generation to as far as the wine industry to, to continue in the industry. Um, I know for a while, it just seems like you, know, you someone started a winery cause they changed their career and they, you know, they get to an age where, you know, they, they can't, can't or don't want to run anymore, but the kids are not interested. They do whatever they want. Is there, is that still happening a lot in California or do you feel a shift? Cause I feel like there's, I, I'm hearing more and more that there's a, the next generation is taking over. Uh, the wineries. It is. Um, I think well, let's let's look back a little bit. California wine industry. Uh, it really started in the seventies. Uh, Paso or uh, California itself was. Uh, you know the wineries have been out here since eighteen hundreds, but it really didn't take off until the seventies. And if you look at the trajectory since the seventies, you know California wine industry has shot straight up. So with that, there hasn't been many generational opportunities for it to evolve. In Paso Robles, um, I would just, you know, as you're saying that, I was thinking about it, of my friends um, that are into it. I know of uh, five families now. So uh, uh, Austin and I, one of our best, our good friends, Janelle Ducey, her family's been in it since 1800s. Janelle's now uh, the third generation uh going into the wine industry. Um, I, I know a couple, you know, Justin Smith is the second generation and, uh, you know, Austin's second generation into it. I know probably, you know, a good half dozen people down here that multi-generation that's been here in Paso are, are now the second generation going into it. So, uh, yes, you know, we're now starting to see multi-generational uh, things. And I think a lot of that is what brings the quality and kind of the standards up uh, is seeing that. So not just new evolution, but the multi-generational uh, family farming has, has really been taken off. Uh, similar in Lodi. Lodi has been kind of the similar aspect as that too. Nice. You caught me as I was taking a sip of water. <laughs> for, for, for the people, for, you may or may not know that um, JC actually can't see me. I'm like, my video is locked in place right now, but we, we have the audio going and I have another camera, which I was already going to use anyway. So 
Um, so I was going to take a sip of water and then he paused. I was like, oops. <laughs> anyway, um, so uh, we keep talking about Paso. So for people who don't know where Paso is, where, where is it in California? So a little funny story on that. So when Oz and I first started, we would travel everywhere trying to, you know, get our name out, get our region out. It's past Robles. And we would always show up, uh, you know, I would show up at every event back east with a map in my back pocket. And I'd pull the map out and I'd say, you know, L.A., San Francisco, we're right in the middle. We're three and a half hours north of L.A., uh, three and a half hours south of San Francisco, right in the middle of the state. Pastorals. And then I would say, have you heard of Hearst Castle? Have you heard that we're right inland of Hearst Castle? And then it was, we were two hours uh, uh, north of Santa Barbara and two hours south of Monterey. And then now when you travel around, everyone knows where Paso is or they have a story or they heard about it. So Paso, we're about 20 miles inland from the coast, uh, right inland of Morro Bay, uh, Pismo, um, San Simeon, which is Hearst Castle. Uh, it's about 20 minutes in from there. We're right in the middle of state between LA, San Francisco there uh, on the 101. Uh, the cool thing about Paso is because of its location. So we're inland, the, the San Lucia range runs right between us and the Pacific Ocean. Uh, so Paso will have 100 degree days. Uh, but it'll have 50 degree nights. So the diameter temperature shift is one of the most uh, in the state or um, there's very few areas that have that big of a diurnal temperature shift from the 100 degrees to 50. A 50 degree swing is big. So a lot of times it's 100 and you'll walk outside if you're going out to dinner and you'll bring a jacket with you because when you leave, leave dinner, it's going to be 55. Uh, so it really cools off. And the other cool thing is it can be 100 degrees and there's a beautiful beach right over the hill here, Cayucas, and 20 minutes from 100 degrees, you can get in your car and 20 minutes away, it's 65. Um, so if you can imagine just driving you know, a few minutes and being at 65 and be on the beach and come right back and it's 100, uh, that, that's kind of a, a cool thing. It's kind of, you know, you go back east and, and uh, you drive 15, 20 minutes and, and it's the same temperature. Uh, so it, it's something that everyone looks at you like, oh, wow, I never even thought about that. Um, but what does that do for the grapes? And what does that do for Paso? So what happens is when it's cool at night, uh, the grapes are able to retain their acidity. Uh, the heat during the day, what that does is, is the ripeness. Um, but also there's a chemical compound in grapes called mercaptans. Uh, that's the, in, in Cabernet, that's the, uh, the bell pepper, um, kind of the, the green notes of those, um, the hot days kind of age that out. And as you notice, a lot of the, the past rules wines do not have a lot of those green flavors as they do in cooler climates, uh, because of the heat during the day, it, it pulls those green characters out. So you, you have less of that, but you'll still have, um, uh, the, the herbal uh, notes to it. So Cabernet should have an herbal kind of a flavor profile to it, but it should not be green. Um, and so a lot of times I'm always trying to explain like, here's the two nuances that you're looking for um, and just be careful not to confuse the two together. So when they say tobacco in a, in a Cabernet, uh, it's more about the herbal essence than it is about a, a green quality. Exactly, exactly. So uh, speaking of the Chinon, so it does normally have uh, that that bell pepper appears in a quality to it, but it's expected in there, whereas it's not expected in other parts of the world. So when you do get it, either you had some a really cool vintage or something yeah. something wrong happened. It was harvested too early, that type of thing. So um, I particularly like that in my wines, but I also only want it when it should be there. So yeah. if it's something that shouldn't be there, then then uh, my first thought is, was it a cool vintage for some reason? For some reason, we haven't had a lot of cool vintages in the past 20 years, really. Um, and if it wasn't a cool vintage, then what happened? You know, was there something in the winemaking? Was there a decision made that they needed to 
pick early because maybe the rains were coming or something like that, you know? Yeah, no, and, it, and it's in the different bridles have those different pyrazines that, that uh, you look for. And it doesn't take much heat, but, uh, and a lot of that too is exposure, uh, the grapes exposure to the sun. Uh, and two things can happen. A, when you have good exposure of the grapes to the sun. So that means that the when the grapes are growing, that you pull the leaves and allow the sunlight to hit the grape itself uh, directly. But you have to be really careful because uh, grapes can sunburn. And so yeah. sometimes you see a grape and it has a little brown on it. And that's sunburn. And that sunburning uh, burns up and takes away all of the uh, tannins and color. So it makes the color pigment um, not stable. And so you got to be really careful that you want to have morning sun on there. And then in the afternoon, you want it shaded so it doesn't burn. Um, and so those are all the kind of practices that uh, really have evolved in past robles that, that people have been getting really good at. And, uh, and it's hard too, because, you know, we've always been a, a big push for innovation. Uh, we're always looking, you know, what can we do to do better? Uh, that's the winery. Uh, vineyard, everything we do uh, from packaging to you name it. Uh, we're always looking at what can we do better? And uh, we've always been kind of a pioneer in this area, a uh, leader of, of pushing for those things. And it's we're getting pushed harder now because everyone's really starting to catch up in Pass Robles. There's a lot of great brands and uh, you're seeing great scores out of Pass Robles. And now, you know, we're really pushing this to stay out in front there and, and really grow. But Part of it too is, as everyone does well here, you know, it's now people are hearing about past rules. People are recognizing that, that we're not having to push so hard to, to let people know where we're at, that people know where we're at now. And, and uh, uh, they've heard about their brands. Uh, yeah. Often we, we talk about restaurants and we go to a restaurant. Um, we were trying, you know, as a Paso brand, we were trying to knock off, um, another Paso, you see another Paso brand there and say, oh, hey, we're better than them. Uh, now, when I go to a restaurant and I see a Paso brand, I say, great. Uh, you could have more than one Paso brand. You should have three Paso brands on there. Let's, you know, th there's room for all of us and we're all different styles and we're all great quality. Um, so that's one of the big pushes now is, is not trying to push off another Paso brand, but uh, to be more Paso Robles wines on that list, you should have a half dozen pass of wines on that list. So I can tell you that. Half dozen that yeah, I, I can tell you that I, I've not had a bad pass of wine. I've had quite a few different ones. Um, and every single one I've had, I think the quality is there. Yeah. And that, and I'll, and I'll be the first to admit in the past that that was not always true, that uh, there was some different styles coming out of pass rolls and now the wines coming out of here are collectively just, you know, all been great wines. I have, I can't remember the last one I had that I was like, eh, I, you yeah. know. Um, but as, as you kind of grow and evolve and, and, uh, and everyone kind of comes in here and has different ideas and, and do those things, now we're having different styles uh, of winemaking, kind of, you know, similar, similar wines, but, uh, slightly different styles and everyone's kind of putting a little bit of their, their signature on it which is great and uh and it's being in a consistency of that 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 i love to see those things uh see the different wines and then you can kind of show people around say you know here's some different uh signatures that you see on these wines that that can be done in paso all right so you, you've mentioned styles um and you've kind of already touched upon it with with the brands and what what they're what they have going for them is there is there between the brands is there like some dramatic or maybe not so some dramatic changes in how the wines are made um is there is there is there like some type of thing that you know with liberty school you you have some certain type of winemaking style or techniques that you're going to use with that versus say austin hope or troublemaker or or, or any other brands uh yeah we have our own style for each wine um kind of through evolving most all the wines are made uh similarly so if it's if it's a great way to make wine why don't you do that on all the wines now what differentiates the different wines uh 
is yeah we do a little bit more push on those so livery school every one of our wines uh when it ferments uh we shovel every tank um and we separate the press lots from the pre-run on every single wine because that's the best way to do it why not do all the wines that way so livery school is made just like we make austin hope and triana uh just the great quality and everything else is, is those steps up higher but uh, if it's a great way to make wine do all your wine that way uh, but livery school we wanted to have you know fruit uh the fruit forwardness to it uh we don't want the tannin structure to be so intense so a lot of it is the vineyards that we work with uh, the winemaking we don't want to have you know we'll mix it it all goes to the barrel i think barrel is very important in terms of the red wine and how they age and the age quality of it um, but uh, we'll do a lot more of the neutral barrels so that it's it's less impactful to it um, and has that fruit style to it so each wine has its you know own style to it. We do a lot of processes here. Um, we're also, you know, trying a lot of different styles. So over at the Austin Hope facility, our state facility, we do a lot of experiments over there. Um, and and some of those things are are uh, and I don't want to go too deep in them because you know we uh, a lot of this effort that we do, uh, we spend a lot of money for and we spend a lot of time investigating and how we do the process uh, but we can do things all the way down from uh, um, we're checking the phenolics and tannins and anthocyanins of these grapes as we do them and we're separating those out uh, from the tannin structure and then during fermentation we're actually checking the tannins uh, versus just tasting it or having it from uh, the alcoholic fermentation we're checking the tannin structure and how we uh, separate so sometimes we will pull wines before they're dry off the skins and finish them off skins. And sometimes we'll leave them on the skins for 60 to 90 days after fermentation. Oh, wow. Uh, so our extended macerations are just incredible length. Um, and so I developed some gassing mechanisms so that we can gas the caps with argon to keep it from oxidizing, but they'll sit on the uh, skins. And if you imagine kind of, all, all uh, tannins, colors, ethocyanins, everything comes from the skin. Grape juice itself is, doesn't have color. So if you think of a rosé wine, rosé wine coming from red grapes without color, tannin structure, um, similar things. So all of the colors and tannins come from it. And if you imagine the longer you have it on there, uh, it actually starts, uh, the structure goes up to a point and then it starts to curve back down the other side. Um, and the grape skins and solids will actually start finding uh, the colors and tannins and structure to it. Uh, and so it almost softens it up um, and you can almost get an aldehydic kind of flavor to it and then you can pull off and then that's where you have the, that style there. So a lot of that is experiments that we do and then we implement the successful experiments into the you know big winery on everything else we do. All right. Yeah, you were talking about the livery school being being a lighter version. When I watched that review, I said it, the tannins weren't like really big. It was easy to drink. Um, it was tasted really good, and um, but it was it felt like it was a lighter cab than maybe I was expecting because I, I at, at, especially at that point in my wine drinking career, um, you know, I expected cabs to have a lot more tannin to it. And it, I think it just kind of surprised me, and it was it was a good surprise. No, and I think it's it's elegant. It's not that it's soft, uh, but it's an elegance through it. And uh, and that's always something hard to, to describe to someone is uh, some wines can be softer and just don't have a structure to it. But sometimes you can have great structure uh, with elegance. Uh, so it doesn't have to have a grippy tannin structure on the sides there. Um, it can have just the smooth tannins. Uh, the fruit and the style, and it all balances well together. So, I was telling you earlier, you know, we were doing a, a few new brands, and and so right. there, there's a brand new Liberty School Reserve, uh, and that kind of really goes with what we just talked about uh, in terms of the fruit and the style and the weight of it, uh, without having that uh, grippy tannins or dry tannins to it. Um, that was kind of the focus on that Liberty School Reserve. So that's 
you know, you talked about the 07 and how it had that flavor and that structure to it. Um, that's what we're doing with that reserve. So it's going to have big fruit, uh, great kind of a whole uh, package to it, but very elegant and uh, easy drinking. That's cool. I look forward to seeing that soon. So, yeah, we always have, you know, we have new projects and new ideas and, and uh, you know, Austin, Austin is that person that's always, you know, you know, what is, what, what do we want to do? What, what do we want? What's our goals here? And then my ideas are, are kind of how do I make that happen? Um, and, you know, what is the best way? So uh, we really, you know, we're very focused on everything we do and, and and, and each one of these things, uh, but there's always the little tweaks and, and ideas that kind of evolve from, from each one of our wines. Um, if we could do every wine that we can think of, man, we would, we would have a hundred out here. Uh, <laughs> I bet you would. Yeah. It, it's just, a, you know, we do, uh, I do 22 different varietals in here. Uh, there's a lot of wines that you, you never see, um, uh, that we do, uh, I do a lot of little stuff that we do for, you know, personal use, uh, just to kind of, that's how we learn. That's how we evolve. Uh, Austin, I've been here for, you know, doing this here 23 years and, and, uh, all through those years, you're always, you're innovating and, and trying new things. And, uh, uh, every time you think you have it and you have it all figured out, you learn something new and, and it keeps right. evolving. So. Uh, so throughout this, We've been talking a lot about Rhone varieties, and um, I, I went to the the Rhone Rangers uh, website, and I see that you're you're listed as one of the wineries. Do you want to talk maybe about that? Um, maybe what that is, and um, as I, I check out some of the wines, you definitely have some Rhone variety wines in there too, um, with Syrah and, and all that. And so it's it's a uh, and, and Pass Robles is is a unique area because we have so much. Uh, different uh, climates and subclimates. Um, if you look at a map, and that would have been, I should have. I was Don't worry, that. I'll have one up. I, I, I've got, I've got maps. We're good. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, uh, and I'll send you a little. There's a, I got a couple cool little sheets on that on the okay. different areas. So if you look at the uh, side profile of Pass Robles, uh, we talked about the San Lucia Mountains that start. So those mountains are they're only about 1,800 foot. Uh, but the top of those mountains are the first ones that the storms hit from the Pacific. And so when they hit there, that averages is about 52 inches. They can get up to 52 inches, uh, oh, wow. averages 30 something inches of rain every year. Uh, for us in Paso, that's a lot. And then as you go over that hill and it drops down to the city proper, the city is about 800 foot. In the city, they get about 12 inches of rain. Oh, man. And then as you head east to uh, the Shannon area and the highlands out there, uh, they get six inches. So this is all within the Paso AVA. It can go anywhere from 50 inches to the max to six inches. So that's a lot of rainfall uh, difference. And uh, we're a Mediterranean climate here. So what that means is all of our rain comes November, December, January, kind of February, kind of the winter months. We get no rain in the summer uh, and you know it's it's a cold winter uh dry summers um and with those climates that kind of you know dictates of, of where the different areas are so the rhone areas are kind of uh, on that west side is, is kind of where it does well um on the east side, you can do styles kind of like Australia with the ripe and, and lushness. Uh, on the west side, there's some really cool areas that you can do a lot of that northern Rhone style. Uh, wine's a little bit tighter. Uh, the tobacco and, and the, the neat fruit there. Um, so Paso has opportunity to do some great things in terms of like Rhone wines. Uh, also, it has some you know well-drained soils and the drier climate, so the, the Cabernets and the Bordeaux styles. So it's an area that really mixes the different uh, climates that needed to do these different wines. So uh, Cabernet was always kind of the first grapes in Pass Robles. And then kind of through uh, the early 90s and mid 90s, a lot of people started in the Rhones and we started getting a lot of alkylates uh, for all the Rhone wines that are, 
you know, we've got some Hunter Point wines that, you know, out at Saxum and, and uh, Lenecal Auto, uh, which are our next door neighbors there on our estate vineyard. And, uh, you know, Austin, uh, with Austin Hope Syrah, we were the top 10 wines of the world uh, a couple times in 01 and, and with our uh, white rones. So it's kind of cool to be in an area that we can really do uh, Bordeaux and Rhones really well. And so our estate vineyard, as I said earlier, was was all the Rhones. And in, that's an area that's a Templeton Gap. That's uh, the coolest kind of sub-AVA past Robles. And um, so with that, you know, uh, we're part of the Rhone Rangers, kind of really promoting those. Um, Rhones, I don't think, have as big of uh, following as Bordeaux wines in terms of the wine world. world. Uh, it was always, a, you know, winemakers love making Syrah. Wine yes. critics love drinking Syrah. It just never really took off, uh, I think, in the, the consumer side of it. Um, so it's something that's always been a passion of ours. Um, we love, you know, I love drinking the the Cote Rotis and, and uh, Cornas and, and uh all the Rhone area. So, uh, Hermitage is one of our favorites and, and, uh, Contra you, I love the, the Viognier's there. So those are always yeah. been passions of, of Austin and mine that, that we loved. And with that, we wanted to, to kind of showcase what Paso can do. Um, Topless Creek does incredible runs out there at their areas. Oh um, yeah. <laughs> really points. Yeah. I mean, you know, talking about, especially like Syrah, and the Rome, you know, the Rome varieties and Syrah, you know, we, th those of us in the industry, we, we love those wines. Um, and while Australia, you know, really hit the Shiraz thing, right. And people know it for that. They, that people, uh, a lot of people don't make that association with like the other ways to make Syrah. And, you know, I, I it was about three ish years ago, I was at a lunch. It was another winery, another winemaker was, was in town for a lunch with all of us. And, uh, we, we the kind of was asking about, um, how, how, how to sell Syrah because it's, it's, it can be difficult. Like, and this is my, my, more of my restaurant days. So, you know, Syrah, I mean, unless it was from Australia, it was kind of difficult to explain to somebody why they should be drinking this amazing grape. Um, instead of cab, I mean, that, that's cool. If they want to drink cab, I'll, I'll serve whatever they want. Um, I'm there, I'm there to make them happy and, and, you know, with a smile and give them some really great wine. But yeah, I think, uh, Syrah is one you of those them to explore just... a little bit and say, Hey, you maybe, yeah, <laughs> try this. My life. Yes. Uh... Anytime I have the opportunity to, to get someone to take that plunge, I do it. No, and it's one of those things that, you know, we talk about it. And a lot of times, if you can talk about it a little bit before with a person, uh, it really piques their interest. Because um, sometimes people try wines, oh, I didn't like that. And they don't have, you know, the correct um, framework of what it is. Uh, but when you kind of explain what you're going to see, and then they see it, uh, I think people really enjoy those things. Um and, and, you know, the Rhone wines have always been a, a, a big passion. Um, and it just, you know, I like the styles and the fruit and how the structures are uh, of those wines. Uh, I love the white burgundies. Um, uh, Sancerre is, is, I think, yeah. one of my number one wines for the summer. Um, so I like to explore a lot of these different wines. Uh, also love the, the you know Spanish reds and and uh, uh, Priorats and, and the structure to those wines and I think some of those have kind of given us a lot of our ideas of 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 styles of you know being a, a very uh, um, structured wine but elegant. Um, so those are things that you know we take a lot of clues from those of of those different styles and and I love to to see how those work with us and, and show the Paso region and what Paso can do. And, and I think we're kind of, you know, really lucky to have an area that has diversity of Paso Robles, uh, of the soils, of the rainfall, the temperature. Um, and in, if you look on that map, you see this, 
11 sub ABAs. And we just, you know, came out with those sub ABAs recently. And I don't think you'll see those uh, on the labels too soon, but really what it does is allow people to kind of dive in a little bit more of, of what each one of those areas mean to pass robles and why we have those. So. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't have anything else in my notes really to chat about. Um, is there anything yeah, that you want to, to uh, do you anything that you want to touch on that maybe we haven't done? No, I think that's, you know, uh, hopefully, you know, I can talk for days, uh, and I wasn't yeah. trying to get too and everything, but, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, I can tell you the lot, same. So, <laughs> it, it's, you know, we can go on a days of, of everything else and, and, uh, we can talk about the forest of France for the, for the oak programs, but, uh, we won't go there. Yeah, uh, that's totally fine. Yeah. No, I, I just, you know, I'm, I'm very passionate about it. I love what we do here. Uh, I'd love to invite everyone, you know, to make it out here, come visit us at the tasting room, um, and really see past robles. Um, I think that the area has exploded in terms of people coming out here and people see it and they're like, oh, wow, this is a really cool area. Uh, we're different than other wine regions in terms of, you know, I'm talking about my friends at all the different wineries here. Uh, you know, I'll promote all of them. Uh, we're all friends here and we, we all kind of working on the same, um, on the same ideas. So uh, it's a great, we have a great groups of winemakers around here in Pass Robles. We do things together. You talk about the Three Kings events. Uh, these are things that, you know, we do together that uh, I don't think every wine region really, really promotes the same way as we do here in Pass. So, so and, that, and that kind of goes over everything we do in terms of restaurants. You know, you gotta realize that this is a town of 30,000. This It's not a very big town. Uh, our whole county here is only 200,000. So it's a, it's a very small region. Um, but you got to realize we have five phenomenal restaurants just in this little town, uh, which is not typical of a town this size to have uh, those. But uh, between the wine tourists and, and the wineries and, and everything else that support these areas, um, we're kind of lucky to have all these things. And, and uh as people come in and they see it, they're just like, wow, it's, it's easy to get to now. Um, there's a airport, San Luis Obispo, that's half an hour away. So it's easy to get here to Paso. Um, so if everyone, you know, come visit, see what we do. And uh, I think you'll love it. Well, I can tell you that Paso is on the list at some point in time to, to hit. Um, I mean, yeah, I made the pilgrimage to Napa and Sonoma for one day. Um, so I need to go back to Sonoma, and give them more than just one day of my time, but, yeah. um, no, it takes but, a little bit more to get. There. Yeah. But, um, you know, Paso has been on the list. Um, you know, uh, uh, I actually was, I actually had thought about going, uh, last year. Um, I took a trip in October to, uh, Willamette and I'd always in my head said the next domestic place I was going to was Willamette. But um, uh, Fred Dame, who represents Dow, had been in had been in, in, in San Antonio, and and then he was talking about, hey boys, you guys need to come out to Paso, blah blah blah. And I was like, I could do that, and do, and then I was like, no, I need to give Willamette. I need to need to go to Willamette. I, I like them. I want to go there. I, I'll go to Paso next. You know, um, it's hard because it's like picking the favorite kid. Oh, yeah. And, you know, I do this. I mean, I go and I travel. When I travel, it's mainly to do interviews, but I also will visit, just do visits of wineries. And it's kind of hard to like, okay, I'm going to go to this place first and I'm going to this place next. And sometimes the decision is, well, what what's important to me in my studies? Not just what's important as far as wine, but, you know, what, when I take an exam, what area am I going to be most likely asked about? And what's the best way to learn about an area is to go there and immerse yourself in the area, not just the wine, but the food, the culture and, and meeting the people. It helps reinforce and reinforce the learning, but there's, I don't know, there's probably a hundred places in the world I want to go visit. Not, not just for exam purposes, just because it's going to be a cool place to go and, and visit and taste some really cool wines and then some great food and then other beverages that are made, you know, I, I try to totally immerse myself if there's great beer locally, if there's great, you know, liquors and liqueurs, you know, I, I try to get the whole cultural experience 
and uh, because it's everything's so uh, intertwined with food and beverage that um, you know I, th I think it really drives home that point and it really reinforces all of it. No, so and, sure. and it's a great area. I mean, it's 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 a whole another world and and uh, kind of the whole Burgundian style and uh, and weather and everything there. It's a beautiful valley to see. Oh yeah, um, it is. Absolutely you know, and is. And has some really cool growing areas out there. So. Yeah, I I uh, had some amazing an amazing time out there, and uh, you know it, it was a very very special place to go to. Every place I go to, I have a great time. I, I always find that the people are very hospitable, um, that it's usually really beautiful area. Bordeaux isn't exactly the most picturesque, at least on the left bank. It's pretty flat. No. <laughs> but, but, I mean, it's still vineyards, right? Uh, and the chateaus, you know, are still pretty magnificent-looking buildings. But, um, you know, as far as the landscape, you know, I've, I've been to Burgundy. I've been to Germany, went to the Mosul and the Naha. You know, Napa, Sonoma, so Willamette. So I've, I've been to some pretty cool looking places. Um, and, you know, so that's part of the reason to go to these places is just to experience that. But, uh, but yeah, and everyone's always been hospitable. I think it's just the nature of the industry. I mean, we, we all want to share wine with each other. And, you know, it's a great way to, to have a good time. And, and I think it's just natural that when you go visit a wine area that the people are just nice, you know. Yeah, no, I think it's a it's a it's a big thing about the personality of the area. Um, we're very in in terms of the the personality area. Uh, Walla Walla has a, a very similar uh, kind of feel to it. Uh, I spent a few trips up there, and kind of the people up there is similar to Past Robles, where everyone's uh, kind of works together as a team to to really promote the area. So. Uh, no, there is some great areas. We're in, you know, we compete with a lot of great areas uh, throughout the whole Western United States here, of, uh, you know, between Oregon and Washington and, and those places that are just kind of evolving out there. And uh, uh, in California, there's a lot of established wine areas that, that we also compete with. Um, but I think Pass Robles has a lot of aspects that, that aren't replicated in other areas. Uh, exactly. That makes it free. So exactly. I mean, you mean you touched upon with the diversity of stuff. I mean, you can pretty much find no matter almost no matter what style of wine you like, you can pretty much get it from that from that ABA. And not a lot of places in the country can claim that. You know, no, it, it's it's crazy amount. And then uh, you know, kind of a, a reversal of, of what people think about um, to you know. To the south, there's a really cool region, uh, and to the north, there's really cool. So if you go 45 minutes uh, to the south, um, you have the Santa Maria Valley, um, Los Olivos. Uh, these are areas that are 70 degrees year-round. Uh, and the same thing with Monterey. Uh, the whole Monterey Valley that's an uh, hour and a half to our north, uh, it is 70 degrees year round there. 82% uh, of every greenery that's consumed in America is grown in that valley an hour to our north. Um, it's just an incredible uh, bread basket right there, or vegetable basket, whatever you want to call it. But <laughs> right. Salad bowl, if you want to call it that. Um, but that little area, so if you think about when you see Monterey wines and, and uh, and the Chardonnays and the Whites and everything, uh, that area is an incredible area in terms of agriculture. Um, and a lot of it is because of that temperature there. Uh, whereas past rolls, we have the, the warm days and that 100 degrees that, that finishes it. Um, but you also realize, too, when we talk about the 100 degrees, is, is we're talking about a 13% or under humidity here. Right. And it does make a difference. I know people talk about it's a dry heat, but it's a dry heat. But, it, but it, when it is a dry heat, it's a lot better than being in Houston, Texas, 100 degrees. I've done that. Yeah. <laughs> and, and 70 to 90 percent humidity. Yeah, it, it's not fun. Well, JC, uh, um, you probably have stuff to do. You know, you, you actually are working. I'm not. <laughs> this is my off day from the day job. Um, I really appreciate you sitting down with me. Um, 
and uh, I'm gonna I got a little warning for my recording software anyway so um, really appreciate you um, hanging out with me and spend some time talking about uh, the Hope Family Wine stuff and um, uh, yeah folks we're gonna we're gonna wrap this up the computers complaining to me i'm using my laptop which i don't normally use my laptop for skype calls um but uh yeah so we're gonna wrap this up i'll have links uh below for uh the winery and uh so you can check out all the stuff that they're doing and of course i have links above and on the website you want to check out all my stuff and i'll have stuff in the description below and um so yeah so thank you all for stopping by and we'll see everyone again next time all right thank you take care Thanks, you too.